'Twas the night before Christmas when, in a hotel in India, something dreadful was stirring. As most people were snug in their beds, a wealthy Russian businessman, politician, and one-time critic of Vladimir Putin flew through the air to land on the floor with a towering thud. And so it was, a winter's nap became an eternal trip to the afterlife. He was just one of many Russian oligarchs to have mysteriously died lately in circumstances that would compel even the least curious of you to mutter the word conspiracy. People are saying something wicked is afoot within the ranks of Russia's mega-wealthy. The words Russian death syndrome have been used ironically, but the humor is lost on the Russian oligarchs who might be next. What ties all these deaths together is the question on everyone's mind, and that's what we'll investigate today. The man we just talked about was Pavel Antov. The 65-year-old had just celebrated his birthday on December 22nd after booking into that hotel with three of his friends. Given Antov's wealth, we think his accommodation, the Hotel Sai International in Rayagada, in the eastern Indian state of Odisha, was pretty basic. Rooms in January are going for about 40 bucks a night, and Antov was said to be worth at least 140 million. But the lack of luxury on that night isn't what we're here to talk about. What we want to know is how Antov died, given that he joined a long list of oligarchs who've bitten the dust lately. One of the problems with getting the truth is that Antov's body wasn't examined by a pathologist. He was cremated the day after his death, a procedure earlier given the green light by the Russian authorities in India. The cause of death was pretty obvious, given he'd fallen from three floors, but how he got to the floor should pique your interest. Was he pushed or is there another explanation for this? As it stands, we don't know, but the Indian police rightly treat the death as suspicious. After all, this millionaire, who'd made a ton of money doing business in sausages of all things, and who'd been a successful lawmaker in Russia's Vladimir Oblast, had been having a good trip up until two days before his death. We'll explain soon what affected his mood. The crime branch in that part of India got on the case, but seeing as he'd been cremated already, the investigation was somewhat cut short by the lack of a body. Before we go on, we'll just mention a little point we think you need to hear. During Russia's invasion of Ukraine, Antov had apparently spoken critically about a Russian missile attack on a residential apartment block in the Shevchen Kivsky district of Kiev. He took to WhatsApp and mentioned citizens being pulled from the rubble, saying it's extremely difficult to call this anything but terror. Strange thing is, and you're going to hear a hell of a lot of strange things today, is that he soon deleted the message and wrote that he was a patriot of my country. We wonder what compelled him to change his mind. He later said he had nothing to do with the message and it had been written by a critic of Russia's so-called special operation, adding that he absolutely did not agree with this man's opinions. Now back to India. The top cops in the Odisha said they interviewed everyone at the hotel and all the staff. They explained that they'd gone through the rooms where the Russians were staying, 319 and 401, and collected mobile phones, laptops, and other important things. They interviewed two other Russians, Turov Mikhail and Pain Sinko Natalia. As you'll have noted, we said four Russians booked into that hotel. The police couldn't interview the other person because he was also now nothing but a pile of cremated ashes. He was 61-year-old Vladimir Bidenov, a good friend to Antov and also a very rich man. They'd both been sharing the room when, sometime around the night of Antov's birthday celebrations, Bidenov collapsed and died. We don't know exactly how he died, but an initial report said it was perhaps a stroke or a heart attack. Al Jazeera wrote that it might even been a drug overdose. It was reported that both men had been drinking large amounts of wine, but that usually doesn't constitute a drug overdose. The Russian consul general in India, Alexei Adamkin, told the press that there was nothing suspicious about both deaths, adding that they're not being treated as criminal cases in Russia. The first one, he said, was a matter of failing health, and the second was down to sadness at the loss of a lifelong friend. However, something just doesn't ring true, given what's been happening to Russian oligarchs as of late. Indian investigators at least have not given up on these cases being crimes. On New Year's Eve, they got hold of the cremated remains so pathologists could perform more forensic examinations. It's not impossible that something could still be found. Any forensic pathologist will tell you that traces of poison can be found in cremated ashes in a forensic toxicology lab. It's also reported that India's National Human Rights Commission is now on the case. Some of you might now think there's nothing to be suspicious about. After all, Russian oligarchs have been through quite a rough stretch as of late, walking on eggshells where Ukraine is concerned and getting their assets seized in various countries. Maybe you think there's a good reason they'd be sick and depressed. Some people are bound to have died of various non-criminal causes in such a stressful environment. Let's see if you're saying the same at the end of the show. Vladimir Putin, who back in the day ensured most of the oligarchs got to keep all that money many of them had looted from Russia, would just tell you the deaths of two men in a hotel within two days was merely an unfortunate event. 
And sure, he'd likely say he forgives Antov for bad-mouthing Russia's bombing of an apartment block, but the deaths of those two men are merely the tip of a blood-stained iceberg, such as the sudden death last year of a man named Ravil Maganov, who was about as suspicious as you can get. It was notable because Maganov had been very critical of the Ukraine invasion. Up until his death, Maganov had been a chairman of the giant national oil company Lukoil. As head of the board of directors, Maganov and the other members of the board came out and called the invasion a tragedy. A statement also said, We strongly support a lasting ceasefire and a settlement of problems through serious negotiations and diplomacy. They were certainly walking on shaky ground by saying that, and no doubt Putin was enraged by such traitorousness. Still, Luke Hoyle knew very well that to keep business booming and to go ahead with its planned expansion in Europe and Africa, it had to toe the line in terms of how the world thought about the invasion, and Putin was not impressed. In September, Maganov was a patient at the Central Clinical Hospital in Moscow when, like Antov, he took a trip through the sky, this time flying from the sixth floor. Luke Hoyle wrote in its website that its chairman had passed away following a severe illness, only adding Luke Hoyle's many thousands of employees mourn deeply for this grievous loss and express their sincere condolences to reveal Maganov's family. Russian TV news media said Maganov had gone to the hospital suffering from heart issues, but noted that he had been taking antidepressant pills at the time of his fall. Nothing much more was said than that, although Reuters spoke with associates of Maganov that suggested his mind was in good shape before he went to the hospital. Another report stated that Maganov was in good mental health and might have gone to the balcony for a smoke and just fallen off. It seems the security cameras that might have caught that action were not working at the time due to repairs. Huh. Doesn't that always seem to be the case with high-profile deaths? If this is starting to sound dark, it's about to get pitch black, although it has to be said this next story has a touch of black humor to it, if, of course, you didn't know the victim. He was 43-year-old Alexander Subotin, who, lo and behold, had also worked as a top executive for Luke Hoyle. His death takes the biscuit for outright strangeness. A Russian news agency said this billionaire had been trying to get his hands on what some reports say was a cure for a hangover. Still, it seems more likely he was after something that could help him detoxify from either alcohol or drug dependence. The report states that he ended up at a house in Moscow where it's believed a shaman lived who had a kind of antidote to help with withdrawal symptoms. The news agency said Subotin was subjected to Jamaican voodoo rituals, which involved having toad venom injected into his body or at least having some rubbed on a small incision in his neck. People do actually do this to induce a psychedelic experience, and there are some cases of people doing it as a method of detoxification, but it's strange that a billionaire would seek out a very experimental treatment when he could afford the best detox that money could buy. Russian law enforcement said that's exactly what he did, and right after he suffered from a heart attack. The same report said he was given some valerian root and died the next day in his home. The Russian police said they were investigating the matter, but we don't know what came of that. Another top executive to bite the dust was Leonid Shulman, who was the director of transport at Russia's giant energy corporation Gazprom, one of the biggest public companies in the world. He was found at the start of 2022 in his cottage near Leningrad. At the time, the Russian media didn't give a cause for his death, although it was later stated he'd been found covered in blood next to a note. Almost exactly a month later, 61-year-old Alexander Tayulikov was found dead in that same village as Shulman had died. He also was a top executive at Gazprom. We don't know the contents of the note, but we do know that a few news reports said that before he died, he might have taken a beating. The Leningrad Region Investigative Committee told the press forensics were already working when a group of heavies arrived in three SUVs. They said they were Gazprom Security Service, surrounded the territory, and put us and most of the police outside the fence of the house. Gazprom did not comment to the press about these deaths. In July, a 61-year-old man who was CEO of a subcontracting firm working for Gazprom was also found dead in Leningrad. His name was Yuri Voronov. Like the others, he'd made millions from his business but seemingly became very depressed all of a sudden. His body was found in a swimming pool at his mansion. There was a hole in his head and a semi-automatic Grand Power pistol lying nearby. Reports say several spent cartridges were lying at the bottom of the pool. A Russian investigative committee said the death might have been due to a quarrel with partners, while his wife said that he had indeed a falling out with people he was doing business with. Nonetheless, initial reports said the security cameras around the mansion had not picked up any images of strangers visiting the house. Another Gazprom-related death in 2022 was that of 37-year-old Andrei Krukovsky. He fell off a cliff while hiking at a ski resort owned by Gazprom and managed by him. He had a lot of experience hiking, too. 
Anyone can fall, of course, and it can happen anywhere, just as it did to the former Russian-based businessman Dan Rappaport. After moving from Ukraine to the US after the invasion, he was an outspoken critic of Putin. In August, he was found in the street outside of his nine-story luxury apartment in Washington, D.C. He was found still wearing a hat and flip-flops and had a load of cash in his wallet. His wife said not long before they'd both been making plans together. Was it a suspicious death? The US authorities didn't seem to think so, but others did, including his wife. Some fellow businessmen said his connections in Washington and his history in Russia along with his criticisms of Putin made it naive to rule out foul play. His final Facebook post, a photo of Marlon Brando playing Colonel Kurtz in Apocalypse Now, could mean anything, but it is strange to say the least. The horror, the horror, he wrote, quoting Kurtz. One of the commenters on that post, Jim Brook, the former Moscow bureau chief for Bloomberg and former overseas bureau chief at the New York Times said, Dan, we will miss you. I'm very skeptical. Try again, DC police. If this still doesn't sound suspicious to you, you might want to know about the death of 51-year-old Vladislav Avayev in April. Another multi-millionaire on the list, Avayev was a former Kremlin official with close ties to Putin. He was also the former vice president of the financial institution Gazprom Bank, which had been specifically set up to serve the Gazprom Energy Company. News reports say Vladislav's body was found close to his wife and daughter's bodies at their multi-million dollar Moscow apartment. The bodies were found by another daughter who'd been worried none of the family had been picking up their phones. Police said they found a gun in the father's hand and the other two had also been shot. Various reports said it's possible Vladislav could have been jealous about his wife having an affair and getting pregnant, although this has not been confirmed. It's also possible that Western sanctions had hurt him financially, but the other people said none of this made any sense. A neighbor told the press that he seemed fine and was not the kind of man who would kill. She said he was a nerd, he had no reason to do that. He was rich, smart, there was no way a man like that could kill. Maybe Aviev and his family were killed. Just one day after the Aveyev family was found, a very similar scene was discovered in Spain. The family this time was the Protosenyas, whose patriarch was Sergei, a 55-year-old oligarch worth around $250 million who was once deputy chairman of Russia's second largest natural gas producer, Novatech. Sergei had also close ties with Putin. If the initial news reports were correct, he also lost his mind and went on a bloody rampage. This time, it was at a luxury Spanish villa, and the murder weapon was an axe. Yes, that doesn't bear thinking about. But the surviving son, a 22-year-old named Fedor, said there's absolutely no way his father could turn into an axe murderer. He told the press, my father is not a killer. He loved my mother and especially Maria, my sister. Spanish investigators said they understood that people were speculating about some kind of hit by Russian intelligence, but they said it's all speculation. They told the press everything points to it being a domestic violence crime, a double murder, and subsequent homicide. Anatoly Timoshenko, who was a close friend of Sergei, told the British press, Sergei did not do it. Sergei did not kill his family. It's impossible. I do not want to discuss what may have happened at the house that night, but I know that Sergei is not a killer. Another friend said Sergei did not kill his family. I have known him for 10 years. He was a happy man. He loved his family. He did not kill his wife and child, I'm sure. The investigation is ongoing. It was a similar tale in March, when the Russian billionaire Vasily Melnikov was found dead in an apartment in Nizhny Novograd, along with three of his family members. Melnikov was the owner of Medstom, a very successful medical supplies firm. A knife was found at the scene and the father's body was close to the wife and two children. Russian investigators said there were no signs of unauthorized entry into the apartment. At first glance, you'd certainly not want to work in the oil and gas industries in Russia at the moment because executives in those areas have been dropping like flies. A 66-year-old Ukraine-born oligarch named Mikhail Watford, who'd made a fortune when the Soviet Union collapsed, was found dead at the start of the Ukraine invasion. Like many oligarchs, he'd made his home in England after the UK pretty much laid out a red carpet for those who'd looted Russia. But the warm welcoming suddenly turned sour when Putin decided to launch his special operation. British cops said Watford's body was found in his home in Surrey. They explained that they had no cause of death but that it didn't look suspicious. The British press said the death came at a time when wealthy Russians living in Britain had been attacked, possibly on the orders of Russian authorities. A thing to remember here is that when the Soviet Union fell, it was Putin that made the deals with the oligarchs, basically telling them he wouldn't have them arrested if they played ball with him. Did Putin see a traitor in his old ally? It's not certain that Watford had spoken out against Putin, and it seems that the British authorities might have hit him with sanctions at some point. Maybe he was just stressed. Subsequent reports suggested that stress and what he did about it was the cause of his death. Although some reports said these coincidences were getting ridiculous, and his death certainly raises questions after other suspicious deaths of Russian nationals. 
Then there was the man who fell down the stairs, a mafia-style death if ever was one. He was the 72-year-old Anatoly Garashchenko, the former rector of the Moscow Aviation Institute, and yet another man with links to the Kremlin. Such a death might not, in normal circumstances, look suspicious. Still, given all the other deaths and in light of his aviation expertise being used in a military capacity, you might question just how he managed to fall down some steps, according to the Russian media, from a great height. In September, another Russian with ties to the Kremlin and with expertise in aviation also met a strange end involving a fall. At the time of his death, Ivan Pichorin was the managing director for the aviation industry of the Corporation for the Development of the Far East and the Arctic. He was also said to be a close Putin ally. His body washed up in the Sea of Japan in September somewhere near Vladivostok, with official reports saying he fell off his boat. The CEO of the same company, 43-year-old Igor Nosov, had died of a stroke just months earlier. Again, this might not look suspicious to some of you, but you ought to know that it is unusual for such young men, young men that look very fit, to die of strokes. You might also want to know that poisoning can cause something that looks like a stroke. It's thought people who've died from radioactive polonium poisoning have had their deaths ruled as a stroke, not a result of poison. Arsenic poisoning could also cause a stroke but might not show up on the death certificate. Maybe we're connecting too many dots here. We could be, no doubt about it, but it would be irresponsible of us to not at least look at the possibility of mass assassinations. After all, Putin and his secret services have committed such acts in the recent past. While we probably shouldn't connect too many dots from the distant past, purges and poisonings have been the Russian government's modus operandi for decades now, going back to the dark times of Joseph Stalin. It should also be pointed out that while some defectors have said that Putin could be behind many of these deaths, others have said it wouldn't be the first time that the oligarchs have been a part of a kind of mafia war. Remember, many of these men, or at least their relatives, were called gangsters in the past, not businessmen. As the filmmaker Adam Curtis said in his six-hour documentary on the collapse of the Soviet Union, when the oligarchs-to-be were making hay while the regular Russian citizens starved, they were soon embroiled in very violent mafia-style wars. You just don't know that because Hollywood hasn't made movies about it. There was so much money up for grabs and so little trust among men, and with Russia falling apart at the seams, the powerful had to make alliances. That's why many of them were found with their throats cut or pulled out of a bloody mass of bodies at some snazzy restaurant. The turmoil in Russia, the money available to grab, the power vacuums in industries and governance meant mass bloodshed. Now Russia's experiencing turmoil again, although not on the same kind of level. But are the oligarchs at it again, killing each other? Are they being picked off by Putin? Or are they just suffering from what some people have ironically called the Russian death syndrome, which could be related to the shakeup of Russian money and simply down to depression, ill health, and the occasional outlandish accident? You also have to remember that Putin will not tolerate dissent. Russia has already introduced laws that can mean a lengthy prison sentence for just speaking out of turn. These laws so far are aimed at regular citizens and brave journalists. So, you have to ask, what could happen to the Russian elites if they speak out of turn? Maybe not always in public, but to friends or acquaintances. When things get totalitarian, everyone becomes a possible enemy. Any Russian oligarch who's looked at these deaths and perhaps knows nothing about them would still certainly think twice about opening their mouths, regardless of if the deaths were related to heavy-handedness from the bosses in the Kremlin. Now you should watch how Putin went from KGB spy to president of Russia, or have a look at the insane protection of the president of Russia.